yeah. What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrewed Christianity. Since the year 2008, we've been bringing you audiological ingredients, interviews, you could say, with scholars from multiple disciplines so you can think, reflect, and work through your biggest questions. Now, today on the podcast, you get a little treat, like a hero of mine. Is there, and, and it's not even that I'm joined by two friends, Grace G. Sun Kim and Adam Clark, for this interview. No, 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 no. Uh, it is the one and only Reverend Jesse Jackson. That's right. You know, ran for president, uh, partner with Martin Luther King Jr. in the civil rights cause, international advocate for justice, worked for the overturning of apartheid in South Africa. The first person to put on their presidential platform when he ran when I was two. Uh, universal health care, the inclusion, intentional inclusion of our Muslim citizens, uh, our uh, Asian citizens uh, to advocate for the differently abled on a presidential platform. Oh, Jesse Jackson is on the podcast. He conversation so good. Make sure you check out uh, the book. Uh, which we'll talk about in the interview. Now, before I jump in, I do want to tell you something. Uh, I have a brand new book that just came out. It's called Divine Self-Investment. It is an open and relational constructive Christology. And it is available now. If you go to tripfuller.com, that's my website, you'll find the podcast. You'll find links for everything. But at the very front, you'll notice a whole collection of endorsements and information about this book, and I hope you go and check it out because you know I, I'd, I'd spend a lot of time on it. <laughs> but uh, uh, last thing before we hop in, this was a Facebook live stream, part of the Black Theology class that Adam Clark and I are doing. Uh, if you want to join that and read some Black Theology, all you got to do is go to jamescomewasright.com. Uh, and we're going to have some fun. Monica Coleman just joined this week. Um, we are having uh, Bishop Michael Curry in the near future. So, yeah, it's been a blast. It's been a blast. And uh, so excited uh, to get to read some amazing text and talk to some of my favorite people. Now, get ready because I'm going to tell you about our sponsor for this week. Shane Claiborne says of the new book Rally, this is not your grandmother's prayer book. Or, if it is, I would really like to meet your grandmother. Rally, a book of communal prayers for lovers of Jesus and justice, releases this month from Upper Room Books. Both a cry for action and a comfort for our anxious souls, Rally addresses justice through lament and celebration. Rachel Hackenberg, Oshita Moore, Michael McRae, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove, in addition to others, write reflections, each ending with call and response prayers. They are calling out issues like racial justice, gender inequality, economic disparity, white privilege, mistreatment of migrants and refugees, the marginalized, and many other concerns. The writings evoke hope and connection as we shift through the devastating headlines and they ask us to love without exception. Lord, stir us up to holy action cries this powerful book. Let rally spur you to compassionately continue the important work of loving God and neighbor until all God's people are one. To learn more or order your copy, visit upperroombooks.com slash rally. That's right, upperroombooks.com slash rally. And I will link to it at tripfuller.com. Enjoy this zesty text and conversation with a man who's brought the rally of God's justice and love and who's going to get talking about how Jesus wants to get us out the bubble. The one and only Reverend Jesse Jackson. Well, hello, everybody. This is Trip, and I am here with Adam. It's part of our Black Theology Reading Group and uh, a, a friend of the podcast and legendary scholar. Right there is Grace G. Sun Kim, and she is the editor of a brand new collection of sermons and speeches from the one and only Reverend Jesse Jackson, 
who is the handsome man on your screen right now. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay. Oh, boy. And the, the new collection is called Keeping Hope Alive. I have the audio version right here, perfectly built for everyone with multiple children yeah. in lockdown. Um, and Grace has the text copy. It's quite a collection. And uh, for those of you that know Reverend Jackson, you know that he's been a leader and pioneer in working for justice across the globe and in the United States. Um, and uh, and we're just thrilled for you to be here and excited to get to en- encounter Grace again. So, uh, Adam, why don't you kind of set the stage for what, wh- where we've been and where we're going uh, for everybody? Yeah, thank you, Tripp. Uh, we are we have a very special dress with Reverend Jesse Jackson. Um, and this fits into our larger kind of course objectives um, by talking about the kind of arc and meaning of Black theology. As we discussed uh, a couple weeks back, depending on how you're taking the course, is Black theology is wrestling with both the legacies of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X and really trying to carve out a distinctive faith for African-American people out of those particular legacies of freedom. And we have someone who made their own independent legacy of freedom here today. Someone who expresses the King tradition and amplified it and extended it in ways that were unimaginable, you know, decades and decades ago. It's the Reverend Jesse Jackson, and he's been gracious enough to lend his time here that we could ask him a few questions. And since Grace has actually been the one who's been working with him in terms of this great book that she put out, we'll actually have her lead our discussion. Okay. So thank you so much, Tripp and Adam. It's an honor to be on again with you. And Reverend Jackson, it's always great to do anything with you. So thank you so much for joining us in this Black Theology course. So here is the book, uh, Keeping Hope Alive. It's now in audio, as Tripp has mentioned. And this is a collection of Reverend Jesse Jackson's um, sermons and speeches, and it it covers a wide time span. So, Reverend Jackson, did you want to say a few words about um, the important? Well, I want to just um, kind of point out how important the book is. But did you want to say something about um, how you view yourself in the whole civil rights movement and how the book captures a bit of it? You know, no book can capture the whole spectrum of your work. But just share with us some of your thoughts. Well, the book gives us a global dimension of our work. I mean, the 84 speeches are in that book, Brother Adam, a uh, speech in India, in South Africa, Mandela's been let out of jail. So we, we were trying to, trying to show pressures about, about global work. I, I'm rather convinced in this conversation that still must be bigger, bigger than your culture. All, all that I tell is confined by culture. Uh, when I was a little younger, he said in our churches, whoever I go, take Jesus with me. That's, that's dangerous. Because if he follows you, you're not going many places. He should, he should take you wherever he goes. Very different. If, you follow, if Jesus follow you, he'll stay behind, they're behind the bus. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, you see all the and so and all the time, Christ is limited by culture. And part of my challenge is, is to get us beyond the cultural limitations of the Christian faith to make it a universal application. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you see that very well because your speeches are, as you mentioned, it's from uh, different parts of the world in India, in South of. Uh, South, uh, South Africa and Asia. So we were able to capture the wide scope and the global impact that you have um, created in the world. Because the civil rights movement, even though it is centered here in the U.S., it does have a global impact because there is racism around the world. There is sexism around the world. There is homophobia, all these things. So I think you know, we weren't able to include everything, but even your DNC speeches, it just captures how you want to work for all people. Well, I was able some years ago to go to South Africa in 1979 with my seminary professor, Dr. Howard Shoma, and, uh, and Jack Hodel. And I was naive enough to think we got to South Africa and I could ease in the country. That was the, the part that was real, real high, doctor. And so I eased in the airport Big baby press was there. Why are you here? 
So I'm here to, uh, I'm afraid you're going to put me back out the country, you know. Here to visit friends. Well, you're really here. You're here to visit South African Council churches. Well, you just look at part time for myself. And so finally, what's your politics? And I, they hear me, I said, well, human rights for all human beings. Made human rights from one yard sick. That's it. The headline that says, Jackson appears in South Africa's uh, culture. Human rights for all human beings is, is, is counterculture. Because if you, if you add, put race as a criteria, or gender as a criteria, you live the limit God in the scope of the human rights for all human beings. And uh, I remember with Jesus Christ is his title. His name, he didn't come into Christ or not. Mary and Joseph were not Christ. It's the Redeemer, the Deliberator, the Deliver. And so the Deliberator is not limited by, by time and space. And so I, I'm rather convinced that we have an, a moral obligation to get beyond the limitations of the gospel. Uh, I gotta put this out there. If you were, were born in the sin of limitations, shaped in its iniquity, born in sin of limitations. So if you're born in the ghetto, uh, you, you meet Christ in the ghetto. You limit him to the ghetto parameters. I make this case. We black men live in a bubble created by whites. Uh, how can I put this? Many years ago, as, as the African burial ground uh, on Wall Street, right, doctor? African burial ground. Because the, the biggest trading market for Africans was New York. Mm-hmm. They could move the command and the command exchange. And at some point, uh, they moved us to the island called Harlem. We were really inhabitants and, and the commanders on Wall Street. White people set up ghettos for their own purpose of exploitation. So I'm saying this to you today, that uh, behind the walls and limitations is a theology of piety. You are just. You go to church, you go to school, you go to work, you can marry, you, you compete. One ghetto against another ghetto. We're limited by that. And my experience has been the ghetto theology has limitations, cultural limitations. For example, Grace, if you uh, go to church, do everything the pastor says, do don't drink, don't smoke, be faithful to your marriage partner, all that, that would not equal change. Words of theology of adjustment and piety. Finding how you behave uh, and the, the, the cultural limitations. At some point in time, I was blessed to go beyond the limitations of our culture. So Jesus is power, not piety. Unlimited as opposed to limited. Power, not piety. Uh, when you're in a hole, you do three things, how a thermal would say. One, you adjust to your situation. Most people do. You resent it. You know better, but you feel you can't change it, so you just resent it. But you have to resist. And I would like to think I'm, I'm a resistor. I'm maladjusted uh, to our environment. I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, which was like a, the black man was a bubble, and basketball players in a bubble in Florida. Behind the black bubble, there was a culture of our own, our own religion, our own politics. On survival techniques. The first time I saw a black policeman, I was 20 years old. I saw a black policeman, I saw a black farmer, no black selling goods downtown. Couldn't go to the white churches, and it was our own churches. We lived behind the walls of the, of, of the bubble. Now, the king led us beyond the walls of the bubble. Now, that's what the king, peace fits in. It was beyond the bubbles, the, the, the bubble walls. Most people stay behind those bubble walls. Wow, that's just amazing, all the culture. And then Howard Thurman, I know you read Howard Thurman all the time. Who else are, do you refer to when you're trying to develop this Black theology? And that's exactly what uh, Dr. Adam Clark teaches to Black theology. So what other resources are you relying on? Well, not, not the King is one. Uh, the Courage to Be by Paul Tillich. Mm. 
low power and justice. Because when I went to seminary, Chicago to, 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 to the seminary, so I really took Jesus out of out of my pocket. He started following me wherever I went. I, I didn't go many places <laughs> in a comparative sense. Follow, following Jesus, you end up you end up in the challenging monasteries and temples. You, you follow him, you end up going beyond your bubble, beyond your race limitation. Following Jesus. He has a good versatility in following him. And he, he, he's counterculture. He's part of the culture. He's born on, born on the death warrant and killed by the government in 33. So to follow him is a real counterculture. Mm-hmm. It's challenging the cultural limitations. The firm of some bodiness. It's some, some bodiness throughout, throughout the world. I, I like to think I grew up in a, a church setting that the emphasis, emphasis was piety how you behave, how you don't get in trouble, how you avoid the police. Uh, we finished high school and had been in a big fight and and uh, had not been arrested. He was a good boy with the military, uh, uh, maybe go to college. But you go get an A to get an B, you're still limited and your religion is limited. But when you start talking about the Jesus that I follow now, he doesn't follow me. I follow him. He leads me in some strange places. I mean, places I, I would never have grown, frankly, mm-hmm. except following him. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I jump in here? Mm-hmm. Um, sure. Reverend Jack said, the, the, the birth of black theology began with people wrestling both with the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and with Malcolm X. Now, you as a major figure of the King movement Right. And everybody's clear about your perspective on King. I wanted to ask you, what did you think of Malcolm and how did Malcolm impact your ministry? Well, I really want to answer that two ways. First of all, I think black theology is much older than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, those ministers, the Mark Vesey, those ministers who fought beyond adjustment and limitations, even slavery time. That was a black theology. It was a theology of, of liberation. The, the, the Jesus was their guide to justice. Vernon John, the guy that preaches out the king at the yeah, church yeah. in Montgomery. Uh, so there's always been some ministers who had a theology of liberation. And they applied Jesus to, to that situation. Now, the king was the most prominent because he emerged as a national figure. But we, we've been, some churches have been uh, fighting we uh, beyond pie to the power, beyond cultural limitations for a long time. Now, Malcolm, interesting enough, Malcolm was a rather limited in, in life. Uh, he became a much bigger figure when he was killed in a dramatic kind of way. Mm-hmm. Uh, Malcolm came to the march on Washington, had a press conference attacking the leaders and went back to New York. He taught unity, but everything about his approach was to challenge the leaders, was to attack the leaders. So that Dr. King and Malcolm lived at the same time, roughly, 55 to 65, 68. But Dr. King led him to interpret the back of the bus as degrading, organize the boycott. Not having public accommodations was degrading. The day I think he gave a speech in Washington, from Texas to Florida to Maryland, we couldn't use a single public toilet. We couldn't buy ice cream at Howard Jones. We couldn't vote. We couldn't run a room at Holiday Inn. Black soldiers sat behind knots of POWs on American military bases uh, and, and degraded. So the came forth to change those policies. Still, the Six World Civil Rights Act. It was a big deal. Now, the, the dream speech only makes sense if you ask the long way around. Uh, if the context, I dream of a day where we'll be judged by the character, not color by skin. We came to Washington that day. If you came from south of Virginia, south of Washington, you had your lunch boxes in, the, in your car. Stop at a friend's house with the toilet uh, behind cans and alleys. Uh, humiliation. We, we lived in the radical racial apartheid. And uh, so he, he pulled his horse to, to the big wagon. 
I mean, that's why I ask them. They will lay the groundwork for all this third remarks and comes to make them out of there. Uh, Rosa Parks asked Ms. Parks, why didn't you go to the back of the city? Well, I, every Wednesday, Attorney Fred Green and I used to meet. We met to see how can we validate the 54 decision, which, of course, was the, the antithesis of the, of the Pleasant versus Ferguson decision. She, we, she meant to sit in. She said, she said God would be with her. And so Rosa Parks joins Thurgood Marshall. And the King joins Rosa Parks. John Lewis joins out the King. Since 54 and 65, the America changed. The law changed. We live in our feet. We live under the law. Uh, and so we uh, found ourselves for the Rights Act uh, in 66, 65. Now, the King was in, into big movements. Boycotts, public accommodation. Malcolm was in none, none, of, none of that. I sometimes uh, fringe at, at the comparison between Malcolm and Dr. King. Mm-hmm. Uh, Malcolm in Harlem, he that, that, was, that was the Wall Street challenge Wall Street, you know, same amount as Harlem. Because he was, he was really behind the bubble. Uh, he never really broke behind the bubble and ended up getting killed or arguing about Mr. Bahamas' behavior uh, behind the bubble. His potential to grow was was immense. He died before he had a chance to grow. But in his lifetime, his life was behind the bubble. Dr. King lived, moved to the end of war in Vietnam. That's beyond the bubble. Public accommodations, right to vote, beyond the bubble. Today, the, the fruit, fruit of Dr. King's screen, I was in, you were in Montgomery Black the other day, Sam, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. Richmond, Virginia, Harvard Confederacy. That man, St. Paul, Minnesota, Jackson, Mississippi, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Georgia. All this is the king tree. He changed public policy. We live in our faith, we live under the law. So Malcolm, in comparison, was not a part of those major actions. Okay. Yeah. Well, one time you, you made a comment on how black preachers look at Martin for respectability and Malcolm for t- toughness, and then they have a Pat Robinson theology coming from the pulpit. <laughs> yes, it does. So, yeah. so, what I wanted to ask you—I don't know how you found that though, but that's very good. Yeah, fun. Well, I wanted yeah, to yeah, ask yeah. you how how have you challenged how how have you challenged that Pat Robinson theology in black pulpit? Well, well you just go to the church, big picture of Martin Luther King, they went the Martin Luther King movement. He was alive. They may not, may not have allowed him in the church, by the way, but he's, he's susceptible to death. We love martyrs, not marchers. Martyrs can challenge us. Marchers do. And instead of the picture of Malcolm, it is toughness. In the pulpit, singing the same songs with the same behavior patterns. There's, there's nothing about a Sunday morning sermon that would lead one challenge the walls of the bubble. Matter of fact, most of the, the changes took place outside of the church walls. Uh, Rosa Parks said that that was not a, that's not a mission of society meeting. She was the NAACP uh, still secretary. Uh, the 54 decision led by Dougal Marsh and Constance McAmelon. She constantly might have seen a woman very much in that scene, but we'll talk about that a little later. Joe Rao, Jack Greenberg. The, the stars in that season was John O. Franklin giving testimony and Kenneth Clark, Black and White Dolls, how segregation made Black feel inferior, made White feel superior. That movement laid the predicate for the new day. And, and uh, even as even we saw the verse of John Lewis, we missed the fact John joined the movement. He, he joined the movement. They never speak Mandela and Tombo without speaking about A and C. They, they, formed, they joined the movement. John joined the movement and took it to his logical conclusion to live 80 years long enough to do that. So I'm saying to you today that Dr. the King of the theology of social change, not social service, not analysis of blacks' behavior. And in, in, in a sense, you, you can get a lot of laughs attacking black behavior. Uh, and you can, uh, 
and incite the oppressor to deal with black behavior. So I can't deal with, 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 with white behavior with a plan for with, with power to change it. Mm-hmm. So you're sharing lots of wisdom and lots of history, which is so important because if we don't know our history and actually the sermons and, and speeches that are in the book have such a great wealth of historical perspective and knowledge. And I know you mentioned Nelson Mandela earlier and there, are, I know, and I've heard you at the UN uh, on most of, on many of the Nelson Mandela days, you were one of the speakers and you spoke. And here we have included one of them from 2013. Um, can you just say more about what we who live in the States can learn from what Mandela did? And what, I don't know if you want to say more about your relationship with Mandela. Mandela. Suffered as we're in the prominence. Sacrifice were in the prominence. He was a Methodist by 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 denomination. But his work came as a lawyer challenging the apartheid laws. At some point the church embraced him, uh, but he was suffering on Roberts Island and scheduled uh, never, never be seen again. Became a global martyr behind the walls of Robert Island. But uh, he came out with the moral agenda, a the- theology of liberation, a theology of uh, change. You know, what makes us a good in the soccer field, football field, and basketball court is it, as a principal. Why was it in football? It's hard to be a professional football player, a basketball Whenever the playing field is even, rules are public. The goals are clear, the reason for it is who is transparent. We can make it that whenever the plan for the Ziba rules the public, goals to the referee for the transparent, we make a difference. Now, the idea of getting the plan for the Ziba is a theology because we are just to uneven field, field of limitations. We're born in the sin of limitations, shaped in its iniquity. We must break out the limitations of my birth. You know, many people were first introduced to Black theology um, in 2007 with the Jeremiah Wright controversy uh, during the Barack Obama campaign. And I was wondering, since all of you guys are from Chicago and know each other very well, (laughs) what was your interpretation of that conflict between Jeremiah Wright and Barack Obama? And how did it impact the Black church? Well, Jeremiah Wright uh, preached the same sermons he had preached while Barack was a member of his church. But, but what is said in church without the cameras out when, when it does not threaten the white people is acceptable. You can, you can say what you want to say. But once you move into the realm of public policy, there's different impact. You talk about that behavior and what we should do and all that. But when you start talking about I'm going to be the president, how did that affect everybody? So when Jeremiah Wright said, God damn America, he, he was not, he meant the rulers condemn, condemn America. To you reap what you sow? God is not market, reap what you sow. And that, that uh, our sins come to haunt us. Malcolm, Malcolm called it chickens coming home to roost. And I, and I argued, over and over again, that I serve as a servant of even the playing field. So everybody, we not, must, not, must not limit our talents about race, about geography. So when Jeremiah Wright began to preach a liberation, a liberating theology, the defense of the white churches and the white society, he is in that he had been saying all the while, the Lord, you preaching these powerful sermons behind the closed walls. See in your bubble, it's all right. When you start bringing up your bubble, to, uh, we, we're going to sit, we want to sit on the bus. Rosa Parks was arrested. The bus driver was right, according to his theology. Above the driver's head, the sign read, pillar from the real whites in front, those who violate be punished by law. And she, she decided to burst out the bubble. And they it arrested her. I said, Ms. Fox, when I said, you know, we made the decision to test the case. Three women on the bus got and those drivers said, and they got off. Why did you sit there? She said, well, I thought about getting them. I thought about Emmett Till. I couldn't go back. Emmett Till spoke to us from the grave. 
And this is December 1st, Emmett Hill killed August 28th. Uh, he spoke up from the grave. And so, there's a piece, piece of my theological work right there, challenging unjust laws. And part of modern theology was challenging unjust laws. Malcolm was in New York talking about he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't take dogs back in, in Birmingham. He wasn't in Birmingham. Uh, we, we, we took the dog back and, and, and transformed it into a emancipation. We were trying to look into it. That's it. When Jim Clark gets CTV in the mouth and, and he bled in Selma. That blood blood helped free us. When the, the horses and the dogs beat John Lewis helped us. So the revolution of nonviolence is counterculture. The culture says fight back with the sick. Counterculture is just to have a higher calling. And, and, and moderate, you look at those 13 years of modern of a combination bill for the back of the bus. The day he gave a speech in Washington, by the way, he and John, I said, from Texas around to Maryland, we, we couldn't do anything except on the roof of the walls. But my mom was fighting to bring those barriers down. Malcolm had a press conference. The, the great and the black leaders who were there, they were misleading them. He was not, not part of those movements. The movement for the right, to, I think he came to Selma one, one day. He didn't march, he came to the church one day. Uh, but he, he was not a part of the Selma movement. It was here for us for a housing drive. Not a part of the anti-Vietnam movement. So Dr. Haynes, the odds of liberation, the odds of change, and, and Jeremiah Wright was really in the king tradition of liberation theology. Not, not limiting your mission, the private, private piety. So everything, if you put it into context, makes so much sense. So what Jeremiah Wright was preaching is what many preachers will be preaching. So thank you for giving that insight. If there's just so much to learn and so many other questions to ask you. I know Tripp had a million and we just hijacked everything from Tripp. So I'm sure Tripp has questions to ask you too. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I remember in uh, a sermon or a talk that uh, Reverend Jackson gave in 2008 that's in the book is a phrase that you said, um, uh, we weren't beyond racism with the election of Barack Obama, but we were beyond Selma. And uh, in, in light of the, the, the changes that have happened since 08, uh, post-Obama, Trump, um, and then the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, uh, how would you describe the present situation? The present situation is that we have power, political power. The fact that they are now looking for an African-American woman to be a vice president. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. We reflect about how if they choose Susan Rice, uh, Kamala can be a Supreme Court. Choose Kamala, Susan can be Secretary of State. We have this great, great body of women who are mayors of Atlanta and Washington. Uh, women uh, taking their rightful place in public policy. And we were following that advance of female leadership. It must be in the church as well as in the three strikers. Yeah, and even in Chicago, you have a woman mayor, woman attorney general too. And I don't know, all the leaders in Chicago well, seem well, like well, they're well, all well, black well, women. Well, 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 state's attorney, Kim Scott, okay. state's attorney. Yeah, uh-huh. And uh, Mayor Laura Lightfoot, and yeah. woman mayor in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and in New Orleans, yeah. Mayor Louisiana. There's this women asserting themselves in ways that are different than historic, historic. And so actually just moving into the topic of women, how do you view women's leadership within the church? It must be, it must be bolder. It must be bolder. Bolder? Uh, women are uh, kind of doubly assured here. Black women, 75% of the black church attendance and choirs and all, buses and all that. But there's something about women trying to let their men have a place. The society's been so rough on black men. Like black women have been, have been our cushion. Uh, they've been, been our protector. Black women were raped. Black men were hung. Reason why, as I look at what we do, we reflect rape. You know, the first black man condemned for raping a black woman was 1959. Mm. We, we were comfort women. 
to enforce against slavery on the ears of Jim Crow. Uh, why we just chose us and had babies with us. Uh, what happened with uh, the third from Thurman and his daughter was typical, not unusual. I said, we, we're not Africans, we're not Europeans, we were, we're new roles, not Negroes. We, we're, we're new people born of a raped and rapist relationship. And it says, it says, it says it's who we are. The duality of our consciousness and, and uh, our culture. You, you live, you're looking for a, uh, a friend of monument. Look, look, look at me. You're looking for a, a miracle. Look at me. And somehow I thought we must stress our theology into the change that we see. You know, could you could you mention there have been so many women who have been black women who have been unacknowledged in just the the civil rights movement or the black freedom movement at large. And I'm wondering if there's some women that the general public does not know about that we should know. And I'm wondering, can you identify and talk about their, discuss their significance? Uh, I'll turn your conscience back on my lab. We used to talk about Thurman Marshall. She was right by his side as a lawyer, as a law, law, law professor. Constance Baker Motley. Mm. Uh, you fast forward to Rosa Parks. Mm. She had the courage to sit in. Uh, in 64, after 63 March, we were talking about applying, applying our knowledge. Fred Lou Hamer led the demonstration at the Democratic Convention in 64. Now, the Hing and others, and others, they were the liberals. They were uh, Johnson and, and uh, Mundell and, and, and Hubert Humphrey. And she's Mississippi. She, she, she said, if, 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 why don't represent Mississippi? Mississippi from the Democratic Party. That's right, that's right. And she took that position and she called many, many black leaders who would, uh, we, we, we must be go on at all costs. There's danger of getting trapped in politics. It's one thing to say we, we must be Trump, but you might, you might have demands on, on Biden that make sense too. She said, she, we, we, we want Johnson to go on, but in the meantime, it means all white the delegation from Mississippi. I ain't with that deal. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, and that's where they, where they came from. When she led that struggle. In 57, Little Rock Nine, Daisy Bates. Black publisher led that struggle. Daisy Bates was, was uh, Maryland. Uh, the, the name comes this way in, in the uh, uh, come to me. In fact, it's right down to right down the line. Dar the height. Uh, Notice the absence of speaking in the platform at, at the convention and, and at the rally in Washington. But but you know we also grow. Dr. King was, Jack O'Dell was here now, Southern Registration, and uh, by Russell was a key organizer. He said Jack O'Dell was a communist. He had to back up for the movement, say he was a communist. Mm-hmm. So by Russell was gay, he had to step down. Mm-hmm. Well, we were on beyond that now. That was just part of our story, is it's, it's not, not cultural limitations. Uh, but the Constance Baker was a big deal. Rosa Parks was a big deal. Fellow Hamm was a big deal. Daisy De- Bates was a big deal. Uh, Dr. May Francis Berry, first level president of the University of Colorado. Attorney General Lynch. We were demonstrating in Greensboro, North Carolina, when I was at ANT. Uh, her church was a church for She was a little girl. Her father, Reverend Lynch, was the pastor of the Provident Church in, in, in Greensboro. And she was in that church, came with her journal. So down to the years we've had women leadership. But as we evolve and appreciating uh, the limitations of just, just men, woman mayor in Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Georgia, Charlotte, North Carolina, New Orleans, uh, uh, Baton Rouge. 19 black female judges in, in Houston, Texas. I went to Houston, Texas one time with Dr. King and Andy Young and Harry Belafonte and Rita Franklin was doing a tour for Dr. King, raising money for SCLC. 
Now, the king stepped on the stage to give wreaths and flowers. And they put tear gas in, in the uh, fans. We had to evacuate the building. Wow. The wreath was doing a free concert at the time. And so there has a black man that Mel Sylvester. Uh, Dallas, Texas. Why wouldn't nobody kill and these vast demonstrations? Those humane, civilized males said, don't, don't kill. Dana said, shoot the kill in Chicago in 1968. These women took a very, very different position on, on that. And black, so we live in a culture that is more acceptable of women leadership mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and gays and, 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 and the like. Mm-hmm. We expand our horizons. Yeah, w- one follow up on that: you were you were one of the first black ministers to publicly embrace the LGBTQ community back in the eighties. I was wondering what type of resistance did you get from your fellow clergy, and then how did you transcend or overcome that? Well, I, I told Sunday if I, if I come to your church on Sunday morning, you quite happen to know musicians. I know you're pretty preaching about gays. A church full of gay people, the, the, the musicians, the ushers, <laughs> some of them are m- 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 and ministers too. Uh, that's, that's, that's my point. And so I was a certain prominent minister a few years ago at Christmas time. He was preaching about joy to the world, all kind of joy, and there'll be uh, uh, the sex joy, and there's Christian joy, and there's Perverse gay joy. He just started preaching about gays. People who were screaming out, go, Reverend, go, Reverend, we're gays. I said to my friend, I said, that, that will not last long. Because one, the guy who was directing his choir was a gay from, had been to Broadway. And he was so good. He just, who was thinking, he had the choir moving. And all the gay people in church, and their consciousness was a such, they were willing to take that abuse. We were beyond our bubble. You can't preach that kind of sermon on gays anymore because we're beyond the bubble. And people grow their change. When you put I have to use that out. image of the bubble. <laughs> well, I Sorry, guess the, 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 the basketball guys are behind the bubble. The, the ghetto's behind the bubble. Behind the coastal bubble. And if you live in that bubble long enough, for example, we, we never aspire to be a city council person. We're not a black city councilman in, in the, behind the bubble. Say legislator, U.S. senator, governor. Uh, that's not in the bubble. We were not bankers. Didn't, didn't miss. Didn't miss being a bank teller. No black bus drivers, trailway or greyhound, uh, or assisted buses. We learn to live behind the bubble, and and if your theology reinforces bubble, then you you're limiting the power of God and the mission of the church. You must not accept bubbles that lock out humanity. Well, I went to uh, Luther Vandross's funeral in New York some time ago. Every top producer, writer of songs in the world was in, in Riverside Church. Overwhelming the gay people who write the music and produce. So who are we to limit who God gives gifts to? God is... Uh, uh, not, not limiting his gifts. It's, 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 not, it's not right. It's not fair. It doesn't make sense to do that. And even your coalition, the Rainbow Coalition, it feels like a very prophetic kind of name that you chose back then um, to kind of, kind of bring everybody together because it's not just the Black community that you fight for. You also fight for the Asian community, the Hispanic community, all the, you know, the uh, LGBTQ community, so well, I well, I'm was that, that, that uh, we were inside the run in 84. Really, running was not on my mind, Doc Adams. What happened was that I was doing a Sunday morning radio show, and someone called in and said, uh, you should walk out Chicago Fest, Jane Byrne. She used the platform of Chicago Fest to re- as a Queen's coronation. You know how she behaved, we should walk out it. One man said it's impractical for you to make the record. Who, who can boycott Chicago Fest? Free Music, Stevie Wonder, or Jays, or Dutton, and all these people. Crowd Dogs, Free Beer. How can you boycott Chicago Fest? My, my spirit said, if it's right, it can't be wrong. 
he was trying to go on the battle. He brought the factory battle, then he's a trying to an ally. So we met him in Chicago in Push on a Wednesday morning. Broad cross section said, Enough is enough. They gave me the assignments of challenging the, act, challenging the artists not to cross our picket line. Others had different assignments. I was able to get Steve one of those whom I related to, to not cross the picket line. It's two Steve, Steve wouldn't cross the picket line. The other artists thought wouldn't cross the picket line. Out of that movement came the cry for a black mayor. Harold came, Harold Washington came to the picket line one day. Harold said, uh, I tell you, I, um, don't want to run for mayor. I, uh, the Congress have a good job. We said, Harold, you have to do it. Harold said, tell you what, if you all put $250,000 on the table, 50,000 new votes, I know you're serious. 50,000 new votes, put half a million dollars on the table. Where's 400,000 votes? Harold had to run. Harold broke that barrier down because we heard the voice. Now, I don't know whether the guy was gay or straight. It was just a voice. And that's why the uh, Good Samaritan means so much to me. A man walking down the street and is attending his business, robbed, left to die. Uh, and while dying, he looked up and saw a man of his own religion. Uh, Rabbi, minister, man of God. He knew a relief coming. On the side of the street, Bible in one hand, prayer book in the other, looking at heaven and going to hell. But then another man of his own ethnic group, my blood brother. He didn't even leave by Cain, left him to die. Samaritan from another country, another culture, who worshiped God differently, he held him up. Who is my neighbor? Is the Samaritan of a different race, of a culture, who worshiped God differently? Is it, you may call him Allah while I call him God. How he, so that sermon takes a big meaning for me. It's, it's, it's one of the great global statements about, about the neighbor. And I, I've sought to be a neighbor. And one thing I do know is that, uh, if your ministry is limit, limited to the rest of the process, if you're limited to you help those who help you, that's, that's a small, small ministry. Because in the real sense, Jesus says, so seeds. Some of the rocks, some of the wind, some germinate. You can't count the seeds as they fall. You'll see all that be bigger than your culture. Christ bringing your culture. The language is different, message is the same. When, I, when I'm in Poland or, or Mississippi, People say, I am somebody in self-affirmation all around the world. Japan or Jamaica. And thanks for that affirmation. And in the book, uh, you know, the um, the forward is by Reverend Otis Moss Jr., who was part of the movement too. And then the afterward is Eddie, Eddie Glau, Dr. Glau, who teaches at Princeton. But those who are interested in the book, I think the one of the jewels in the book is uh, Reverend Jackson's concluding thoughts. So I won't be able to cover that today, but I'm just hoping that everybody will read it because there you will find out, you know, where he got keeping hope alive phrase. And that's how we kind of named the book. So I think the conclusion, you know, your speeches and sermons are fabulous, but the conclusion, because it's such an intimate kind of talk and your thoughts kind of from 2019, because that was written in 2000. 2019. I think that's worth the read. So I hope people can get the audio and the and the text. Well, that was Grace. Uh, I um, not the King's Shield in Memphis. We determined no, we were I not. I didn't want you to share it. I didn't we, want you to we, share we let, it all. Let, let one. Let, 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 let one, <laughs> one, one, one bullet kill our movement. We went to Washington. We were prepared to go to Washington to have a, a, a poor people's demonstration. To put focus on make poor people visible. And you go to Washington, to go to jail, to go to demonstrate civil disobedience. That's we got sidetracked by Memphis. You know, since I was in Washington, Reverend Abdad asked me to be the mayor of Resurrection City. Every morning I would come out to a little, little makeshift town, I would give instructions. This one morning I was there, and it was it been raining. It rained every day, we were down that in the mud. And uh, uh, we were very depressed. I was hanging big for April 4, Robert Kennedy killed, killed June the 6th. We, we didn't know what to, do, what to do. So I'm on the back of the truck. People looking at most of the women and children. Most men had left the camp at the time. I had no money to give them, no bus fare to go home. 
White House attorneys back on the day that Dr. King was not there and Robert King was not in the, in, in, in the Capitol. And so I was searching for something and I said, well, I am somebody. I read Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman said, it's your irreducible essence. That you see a God, so you, you, so you matter. I said, I am somebody. And it, it took off. I may be poor, but I may be on wealth. I may be unskilled. And I found that that, that, that self-affirmation theme rings around the world where we go. Because people are in quest of their somebodiness and in their hope. We're in 80, 88, we were doing very well. We, we lost New York. A lot of reasons, but we lost New York. And some staff members wanted to give up. I imagine they gave giving concession speeches. We had to go across the country. We were not just a political we were a movement for justice. So I said, we can't get rid of keep hope alive. And then, 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 and I found between some bondness and keeping your hope alive, your power. Mm-hmm. And, and in a real sense, our, our religion must not limit us to culture, to the bubble. Those who dare challenge the walls of the bubble, you meet with resistance. You lose your job, you lose your life, you lose your public standing. But you have to you have to go beyond the limitations. If Jesus had just stayed, you know, in Bethlehem and preaching in Galilee, it wouldn't have mattered anybody. He challenged the corruption in the temple, challenged the oppression of Rome. He messed up the arrangement. He was challenging the walls of limitations. He, he was born in a, in a bubble, born in sin, shaped in iniquity. He became bigger than himself. It's like a coefficient of expansion. You got to get bigger than yourself. I think our theology is best makes us bigger than ourselves. And we go to seminary, meeting Bonhoeffer and, and, and meeting Tillich, uh, meeting Howard Thurman, uh, New and Dr. King. He sent me to a different place of seeing the world and not accepting the limitations of uh, my orientation. Yeah. So much history lesson and so much theological things to think about. So, wow. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all that. Now, Reverend Jackson, there was a, um, at John Lewis's funeral, Bill Clinton got up and talked about SNCC and made a kind of a distinction between the legacy of John Lewis and of Kwame Ture, right? And he talked basically very praiseworthy things about John Lewis, of course, but he diminished kind of Kwame Ture. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you thought of those remarks and about the legacy of Kwame Ture in terms of, or the legacy of SNCC, I should say, in terms of his significance to the struggle and the legacy of Kwame Ture after that. When the movement 55 and we sat in Greensboro on February 1st, 1960, and broke out around the country and swarmed SNCC from the rest of the spring of 1960. They joined the movement, uh, SCLC and WACP, Urban League Corps, they joined the movement. They were part of it. That's why, that's why John spoke to Washington at the monument on August 28th. The, the youth don't object to it. They weren't playing generational games. We all want a public accommodation. We all want to overcome the humiliation and the indignities of our situation. And so John was a part of that. At some point, some of those guys had a meet one night in, in summer to, to pull John out of office uh, of a cool sorts. They wanted to go another route, a more independent route. Well, it's probably difficult if you go outside. The media, media would take you out there. You, Dr. King is old, young, and let you talk for a while. What's your support base? Uh, if it's not the black church, not black labor, black is black and black, where's your base? He's like, like the you know, flow without the foundation. So Stokely and those guys raise the right concerns, black power, raise, raise our consciousness. The reason I became raised so close to Stokely and all that because bread was what they were talking about. Bread we we were in Chicago, we, we were putting black products on the shelves and building black chains so we put money in black men. We, we developed black power. 
without the inciting language, we just build a black power. We would come to so we need black power, which means black people should consume, we can produce, not just consumers, and invest in ourselves and, and, and develop our own power. But the, 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 the language was, at that time, Dr. Hay wrote a chapter in his book on defining black power. So I think Stokely made his contribution because he he raised the the consciousness, and then Stokely left went back to, went back to the Guinea, and, and wrapped rap ended up in trouble, uh, and, and, and the kind of trouble he's in still in jail today. So, so John Lewis stayed with, with the heart of things, and I appreciate both of both of my, my friends. I went to, I went to Warren Torrey. The hospital in Guinea, and he was dying. I went to visit his graveyard a few years ago and cleaned it up because I cared so deeply for him. But if you're going to lead the struggle, you must define the struggle. The struggle was the public accommodations. If you lived in Mississippi or Maine, black people could not have public dignity. That was what this fight was about. And we were gaining white, white allies to make it happen. I thought we were a minority in a, in a majority situation. It was learn the skills to, to coordinate. For example, when George Floyd was killed, I went to meet with the uh, county prosecutor about arresting officers. He said, we can't arrest officers because they're protected by the FOP and all that. Keith Ellison took over the next day. He then died all four of them. This one may be 5% black at most, or less than that. He's, he's the state attorney, he's state attorney general. He's understood the coalition. So some of the uh, Chigavera models and stuff don't fit our situation here. John helped lead the movement to public come in 64 and 65 at the Congress. He had to lead the con- Congress with a sense of consciousness. So I'm not sure that Bill should try to make the comparison. I'm not sure that's his place to make that comparison. Mm-hmm. But, the, but certainly a different role. And the, and the young people who were excited, he, he was an exciting guy. <coughs> he was very, 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 very talented. And I think he, he made a contribution. Mm-hmm. And most people don't realize that you're, you're, you were the one who actually changed the name of, at least the New York Times, of people from calling us black to African-American, right? Which is kind of reflective of both legacies. What happened was we were in a meeting in Chicago after the campaign. And I always believe we had to change cultural things as well. African-American gives us uh, beyond the ghetto status where we're not limited to skin color. Uh, after all, the Rainbow Coalition, yeah, I either came from... At, at the convention, blacks protesting civil rights. The Little Hills protesting bilingual education. Native Americans protesting land, all that. So uh, together we were with the Rainbow Coalition. So it seemed to me that that we had a, a right a need to, to, to internationalize ourselves, to globalize ourselves. And African Americans have been around for a long time and, and relatively smaller circles. Uh, but we, we took the mainstream. It became a big debate for a while, as you, you recall. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I say black <coughs> sounds better. We went from we color to Negro to black to African American. We, we kept evolving. If we had not done that, the Museum of Science, History in, in, in uh, Washington would be the, the Black Museum. It's the African American Museum. Mm-hmm. We had a case in, six, in, 80, in 88 where Walters was about it and others. We won, won an argument. Well, Reverend Jackson, you're the one who pushed for the term African American, right? Yeah, but also along that same line, going to get Americans out, out of prison in foreign countries. I think that the, the civil rights movement in America has currency global worldwide. So I, I had met uh, in some, some of the independent international movements, uh, the leaders of uh, Syria. Yeah, you got good men out there. 
from Syria, right? It's very rigged to be really caught about people being locked in, in the embassy. I figured if two soldiers died, one white, one black, the white were killed and the black was left. He may leave them for a long time as, as war bait. So we went to, to see the, the ambassador of the series and he let us go. I figured if we got in, we'd get him. But again, going beyond the boundaries and Iraq and Cuba and Yugoslavia. Because I, I went to South Africa in 1979. I believe that we must fight for life beyond the bubble. Our theology can be limited to, to, to black theology. That theology has its roots in, in a soulful way of overcoming odds. But we should not be limited by the, the color of our culture. Our culture is, uh, is the foundation for, 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 for which we spring. Uh, we, our, our deep held beliefs in that culture. I believe in Jesus the Christ, part of our culture. But Jesus was not, not, not limited just to Jews only. We're going to be limited just to blacks only. So one of the one of the things that strikes me about a lot of the stories you've t- told is that they're from the early part of your career, and um, your vocation was both ministerial in civil rights activism and as a politician. Um, and when I was two, you first ran for president. I was just two <laughs> years old, and. When I was two, you were advocating for the inclusion of LGBT people, the recognition of our Muslim citizens, inclusion across different ethnic groups. Uh, you were a vocal advocate for uh, people with uh, that are differently abled. You were the first presidential candidate, um, you know, advocating for a robust national health care system. Um, so many things that you continued to do after the kind of birth of civil rights movement. Are, are now normal things to hear people in the Democratic Party say. And yet, until I learned the story, um, I grew up where Democrats were, you know, the, the Clinton version. And, and those type of things were, you know, radical, and we don't suggest it. And so when I mentioned to one of my, uh, well, I guess I couldn't say their name since this is on Facebook, but a certain <laughs> family member that I was getting to talk to a hero and he said, which one? I said, Reverend Jesse Jackson. He said, you know, I spent 30 years thinking he was a radical and wrong. And now I just wish I could go back in time and switch my vote. <laughs> and, and I think there's a lot of people in this moment that are recognizing that you were 20, 30 years ahead of uh, in, in seeing what justice looks like on the ground. So I, I, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And could you just give us some wisdom of how we learn to see with that the the edge of justice in our present in our situation. Well, well some people have to get to the corner to sit around the curve. Mm-hmm. The faith, something hopeful. You may not sit around. You may not be at the corner. Believe around the curve is is a bright day. Believe around the curve is a, is, is a better world. Some people, some people say, say is believing. But faith is a factor. Some of things hoped for. Uh, evidence of things unseen. And, and I've seen the change in my lifetime to feel good about it, man. But I, I went to Greenville, South Carolina. I, I couldn't apply to Clemson. I went to the University of Illinois play football. Well, the next year, I began with the Clemson, with federal guards. Arthur Lucy with the Alabama, federal guards. And so when Clemson plays Alabama in a big football game, I see a whole different world. Clemson, black quarterback, Alabama, black quarterback. When Moore ran against Jones in the Senate race, and, and, and Jones beat Moore and Trump. Uh, blacks, he won Tuscaloosa, Alabama, University of Alabama. He won the county where Auburn is. Because we're winning this battle. I mean, Trump, Trump is a season. And God's our secret judge. I think that most people in John talking about they know balance is weak and balance is strong. Balance is weak. You, you've exhausted all all you can do. Non balance non balance is kind of cultural. It's redemptive. It takes courage. It takes risk. Non balance can, can can neutralize guns. I mean, in the face of non balance, armies get weak. 
what can they do but guard us? If we had a shootout, we could, we can win the shootout. The shootout is impractical and, and threatening and bluffing about guns to get you killed without any return on, on the killing. If you die for the movement, you get your returns. If you die as a martyr in the movement, it's, it's worth the death. If you die it's for the hell of it, then there, there's no point to it. Nonviolence means to use your body as a living sacrifice. The other thing I found out about you guys' time, I always we do, do this some more. I look forward to talking to you guys some more. You have a, a wall between two people. On the side of the wall is, is ignorance, fear, hatred, and violence. You don't know who's behind the wall. Feel what you can know. You learn to hate what you're afraid of and you become violent. The walls come down, you see people as they as for what they're worth. We on the, we were on we were on the side of the wall where the sun didn't shine much, so we couldn't grow. I like a grow that means something wrong with us. It meant, it meant that uh full of synthesis and grain is a fact in your growth. If we if we're on the shady side, we can't grow. We would have no sunshine. We can all grow when the walls come down. Part of my mission in life is pulling down walls. My mother was dying in hospital some years ago. I was in Greenville, South Carolina, and and so I would go every day and the white people said, you ever have prayer with us? Well, she remember that I in life. She said, we can pray for my family. My husband is quite sick, but put him at the hospital and my son is leg amputated and don't have the insurance. I said, yeah, I pray. I said, I go upstairs and no, 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 I need to go upstairs and just pray for him down here. She didn't want me to go upstairs. Now, Jesse, I like you very much. Now, I'm not with that, that bomber care, that bomber care business. Uh, that, 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 for the health care, I said, yeah, man, you want armor without the eggs. <laughs> you, were, you, you were, I mean, she had been poisoned to believe that affordable health care was against her interests. Mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say? And the theology is not, not limited. We keep going behind these walls. The theology does not accept the walls. I mean, the, the best of theology. And that liberation is whether you're in Central America or whether you're in the ghetto. Black theology is theology of changing the condition. Define the law of limitations. Define the, the laws, the walls that we can see doesn't have sunshine. So it, it, it's, it's named black theology. It's really liberation. Not often do we get a chance to speak to someone who's not just a intellectual theoretician of the movement, but actually a change maker and history maker. So we appreciate your time. We appreciate your wisdom. Is there anything else that anybody wants to say? Where are you teaching? I'm teaching at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. Man, let me come to your class sometime. Don't, 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 don't. Oh, definitely. Don't ban me. <laughs> <laughs> you know who? Well, you got actually you. Try- let me tell you this on camera. I actually uh, had Aubrey Hendricks reach out to you about maybe two years ago to do that, but something fell through. The, the uh, politics of Jesus may, may be the most influential book in my whole career. The politics yeah. of I, oh, I yeah. saw Jesus. I, I saw Jesus different. I saw Jesus different from that book. Aubrey Hendricks is, is, is my number one theologian. Yeah. Actually, I, I, yeah. Um, that <laughs> politics of Jesus, we ha- there was an AR session. I don't know, uh, in Texas. I think that was five years ago. Actually, Reverend Jackson was on the panel. I don't know if you were there. Yeah, he was there. Yeah. No, I think that was in uh, California. I was there, yeah. I I forget where, which country. San Diego. It was San Diego. 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 Okay, Okay, wherever, yeah. yeah. Were you at that panel? Because Reverend Jackson. Uh, yes, was I was at that panel too. Oh, okay. I Reverend Jack, I've, I've talked to Reverend Baxter. We went to um, one of the sessions at the AAR together. He probably doesn't remember, but <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was a few Man, years. let me come to Cincinnati and save me spend some time with you, man. I, I love that. <laughs> it's done. Done. We, we might do a video. We might do a video. We Ooh. might do a video because of COVID, but we, we will definitely have you in the classroom. Soon. Soon, yes. I'm going to get your number from Grace and we'll, we'll work that out. <laughs> you heard it, Grace. Yeah, uh-huh. you permission. Yeah. Yeah. Trip with trip. 
Triple which yeah, way? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trip, trips it up. Edinburgh. So we'll go to Edinburgh when this pandemic's over. That's what we'll oh, do, yeah. okay? Trip, yeah. we'll do it all in person one day. <laughs> oh. it, it, you got to come when it's sunny. You know, okay, it's, yeah. It's, we'll have to come in the summertime. Here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Reverend Jackson. It was so, you know, we know you're busy and you got a whole full schedule. I know he had a meeting just before this one. So thank you so much for spending this time with us. You know, I feel so, I feel so honored today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm do. so honored. <laughs> no, and every time, you know, I've heard a lot of things, but always I learn something new. So today, I that bubble image is going to stay with me. So I'll have to work on that bubble image now. And our bubble, we had our boyfriends, girlfriends, we played ball with the school. The church and weddings, journals, and we live behind the we learned we learned to find the glory in, in, in our bubble. The, the farmer's bubble is, is is limited because white people set the bubble up for exploitation and degradation. So yeah. behind the bubble, you you have joy and happy. Same as other people have you. You know who who who, who can play ball, who can't, who can preach, who can't, who can sing, who can't. But you don't aspire to become legislator. Uh, Governor, governor, behind the bubble. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, U.S. says behind the bubble. The bubble has built-in limitations. If your theology is built around uh, built around the bubble, the, the bubble theology is limited to, to, to how you how you get along. How how can you make it? Yeah. And one of these days it'll be all over. You go into a heavenly place and all that. The bubble theology says stay safe. The ring theology say take the risk. Right. Uh, well, once somebody said, "Give me Malcolm Martin," is that uh, Malcolm would take a group of guys in Harlem and ready to fight? We're gonna take them no more. We're gonna fight back. And hit me, I hit them back, and and uh, we'll do the right thing. And then leave one night. She said, "Oh man, man Malcolm really got him told them, man. His brother should have told it, didn't they?" Now the thing that get a group of scared deacons in church said, "Now." Uh, but Jesus better cross alone on the road, go free. Jesus, MMS Bridge is Calvary. We're, we're going up this hill. Dr. King preached fight in people. Dr. King preached fight out of people. The priest fight the fight in them. You follow Martin, you follow Jesus, you're going to go across Birmingham, MMS Bridge, you're going to die in Vietnam War. You preach fight in people. Does that make sense to you? You get people, you preach fight out of them. To sell all, all, all the right things, mm-hmm. and you even permitted to get white people told behind the bubble, and yeah. see things that is entertaining behind the bubble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's great to have white friends. Like Trip is a fantastic friend and an ally, so he's always here for us, uh, for us people of color and all the liberation, black, Asian theology. So thank you so much, Trip, for always hosting these fantastic uh, podcasts. On, on the Black Lives Matter, uh, Trip, Trip really is black. See, Black Lives Matter not just, <laughs> not, 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 not just a color. Black Lives Matter is a, is a, is a way of seeing the world. Yeah. So yeah. more, more white people are marching than blacks than Black Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. Small yeah, that's town, true. Small town USA, white smarts, they too. Uh, they're saying oppression is wrong. Racism is skin idolatry. Skin worship. Uh, he assumed God made an ontology there when he made a black man. God, God made a mistake. Racism is unscientific. It's politically divisive. It's not exploitative. Racism is mental illness. Mm-hmm. If you sit in there, and then, so when people say something that's unkind, I say, man, sick, not, not, not as a fear. Yeah. But it's yeah. sick to be healed. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm simply saying to you today, my friends, do, do not let racism break your spirit. Mm. We put shame in racism. There was a time when people bragged about I'm white, I'm right, this and that. We put shame in racism. Mm. And no, nobody wants to be a racist now. I grew up in the Socratic Index. Fruit Banks had a small brain. They taught racism in, in, in the universities, in Columbia, Harvard. In, in, in the part that came out of Howard, not Harvard. It's interesting. Harvard had all the books, all the professors, all the writers, all the double pictures. In Howard, not Harvard, was the law that changed America. Howard, not Harvard. Right, right, right. Yeah.
Uh-huh. Yeah. Because that was liberation law. Liberation law. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not, not just that let me alone law. I have a right to the big bubble. All right, guys. Okay. Right. Thank you so much again, Reverend Jackson, and thank, thank you, you Adam thank and Trip. So this is, this has been, it. yeah. You.